What's up guys, Cody Bidlow here with Athlete X. Today we're gonna to be talking about the first three steps, how you prepare to start your sprint, and a couple of things to think about at the very beginning of any repetition that you do. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe below. Consider donating on Patreon, checking out my website, all that good stuff. So, I think it would be reasonable to say that the beginning of the race is important. I'm not here to say that it make it will make or break the outcome of the race by way of determining who's going to win the race, but it definitely will have an impact on the time that you run and uh, perfecting the start or at least optimizing the start is definitely going to make a big difference for you. Now, I'm not specifically talking about the block start today. This can be applied to any type of start, but just in general, this is this discussion is about the things you need to consider when you're starting any sprint. Now just to give a little bit of background, when we start we're overcoming inertia, right? We're, we're at rest, we're not moving anywhere, and what is the whole point of acceleration? Well we want to build up speed. Another way to look at that is we want to build up momentum so that way once we're upright and we're not in an advantageous position to push back against the ground and push the ground away from us behind us, that we have momentum that is sending us forward so we can just strike the ground get up in the air and then fly through the air, hit the ground again and repeat the process until we are at a point where we start to decelerate and at that point we just hang on until the uh, race finishes. So early in the race or in your run, if you're just a practice, the idea is we want to generate horizontal force relative to the ground. So that's where the ideas of lower shin angles, you know, striking into the ground at a low angle becomes important. Uh, and also very important is that the steps that we're utilizing or that we're you know running with are using high amounts of force at the beginning of the run. If you try to be too quick, you try to tap dance your way like you're running through one of those stupid ass uh, agility ladders, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to produce enough force to overcome inertia to start building up momentum, which is then going to transfer into speed. We need to utilize those first three steps of the race or of your rep to generate a lot of force, which then over time, those steps will get quicker and quicker and you'll run faster and faster. So how do we produce a lot of force early in the run? Well, we wanna focus on the propulsive impulse that you create. Impulse is defined as force multiplied by time. So we wanna apply force, do it over a longer period of time and that's gonna give us a larger propulsive impulse which is gonna send us through the air further and get us basically to a higher speed earlier in the race um, without sabotaging our ability to increase frequency as we go. If How do we sabotage our ability to produce frequency? Well, that would be by being too quick at the beginning. If you're too quick in step one and two, where are you gonna go from there? You can't slow down your frequency very well and have that be efficient. So if you are too quick too early, you're gonna hit your, your limit of speed too early in the race and you're gonna have a tough time running as fast as possible. So this is where the ideas of rhythm come into play. It's not that you should be holding back from an effort standpoint, but you shouldn't necessarily try to reach your fastest frequency too soon in the race. Right about 10 meters, elite sprinters are gonna be somewhere between, I believe it's around 90% of their maximal stride frequency, whereas intermediate or beginner sprinters tend to be 80% or below of their maximal stride frequency by 10 meters. So the first three steps, because those are only gonna take you to maybe five meters or six meters, um, four meters for some people, those first three steps need to be slower in that you are using the time that you have to push effectively into the ground to launch yourself through the air and repeating that for a few steps until you've built up enough momentum to where you can start getting quicker and quicker and the amount of time you're spending on the ground should become shorter and shorter. So as you start, one thing that I think is important to focus on is being aware of where your points of contact are on the ground. So how are you balancing your weight on the ground? Is it distributed just over the front foot? Is it equally distributed over both feet? I like to feel a pretty even distribution between the two feet, a little bit more on my front foot since that's the primary push leg, but 
your weight should be distributed over both feet. If they aren't, you're probably going to feel unbalanced. If you're in a crouch start where your hands are on the ground, then you want that to be divided over those four points of contact, your two hands, your front foot, and your back foot. Now, you want to be aware of the angle of your shin because that's kind of going to dictate how you're pushing into the ground. And you want to lock that angle in and push through that angle, not get to an angle and then push through something else so then now your shin moves, your knee either opens up or closes, raises or lowers, and you know, you're taking unnecessary time to propel yourself forward. You want to lock in the, the position at which you're going to push into the ground and not move from that as far as if you watch people start, oftentimes you'll see they'll come up into the set position, their knee will hit a certain point, their shin will be at a certain point, and then when they push, the shin will lower as they push forward, or it'll raise up a bit before they push up and out. You want that to not change much. When you push into the ground on your first step, you want that shin angle to be locked in so you're not wasting any time, and if you're pushing at the angle that you start at, that's a good sign that your positioning is correct. If your knee is dropping before you can push out, you should probably start in a lower position. Alternatively, if your knee comes up before you push out, you should probably start in a higher position. Okay, This is going to dictate where you should be positioned, and that's going to be based off of how strong you are, how powerful you are, how close to the line you should be, how long your legs are, torso, all kinds of factors. But none of those factors really matter if you're just paying attention to what's happening to the knee when you push out. Now, say you got your shin angle locked in and that's all good. What do we want to do now? Well, we want to push, and I don't mean you push until your leg is flopping behind you and just lagging back there and then you fall or forward into the ground because you're staying on the ground so long. But at the same time, it shouldn't be that you just give a little pop and then pull your foot off the ground. The first step should be the step where your, your foot is on the ground the longest. And I would say the first three steps are going to be quite similar before you start building up quicker and quicker over time. Once you've found that angle that is good to push out at, you want to feel when you're still, you know, particularly in practice, you want to feel where your foot is on the ground uh, because that's what you're pushing through, okay? And you got to be aware of where your foot is. Otherwise, what are you doing? You know, if you're not aware of where your foot is, I don't know how you're sprinting. But... Once you've found that angle of the front shin and you're in a good set position, it's time to push, right? Well, a couple things are going to happen. You're going to push into the ground with that front leg, the same arm. So say I start with my left leg forward. My left arm is going to launch, boom. I'm going to throw that elbow forward, I'm not throwing the hand forward, okay? And I'm not throwing the hand back, like opening up, like I'm trying to do a tricep kickback so I'm getting ready for a physique competition. Okay, we want to move the elbow so that way we're moving at the shoulder joint, right? We don't want to just flop the elbow around like this, opening and closing. We want the elbow angle to change minimally, and we want the movement mainly to be at the shoulder joint, okay? So we're going to throw the elbow because if we throw the hand, now we're opening and closing the elbow joint. If we throw the elbow, now we're just main, moving mainly at the shoulder, and the hand will just kind of move as it should based off of how fast we're throwing the elbows forward and back. So right when you're ready to start, you're gonna push into the ground on that front leg and the same side arm, we're gonna throw forward, okay? If you're aware of your body and you can control all these movements well, then you can also think of the other arm going up and back. The, the, the same side arm of the front leg is gonna come up and forward. The opposite arm is gonna come up and back and the opposite leg is going to pop through. Okay, that knee is going to pop through right as you push into that front block. So once you've made that initial push, you've thrown your arms, thrown the knee, and pushed into the block, what happens now? We need to reverse. And how do we reverse that? We don't step down yet. Okay, we're not upright sprinting. We want to strike down and back, primarily back. So as you propel yourself off the block by using propulsive impulse, by using force times time, pushing as much as you can into that block, right, right as you reach the point where you're no longer putting force into the block, you need to switch those limbs, arms need to switch, front leg, which is now the right leg, if you're like me, where you start on the left leg, you push out, and now the legs switch and the right leg's coming through, 
boom, you want to be aware of that shin angle, be aware of your foot, strike down and back, okay? You want that movement to be as down and back aggressively as possible. And once again, we're going to push a little bit. We're going to spend some time on the ground to generate force, to build up momentum, to launch ourselves down the track, okay? So remember, it's the first three steps we're focusing on right now, and those first three steps are going to feel longer than they will compared to any of the other steps in the run. Same thing on the third step. Once you've made contact on the second step, what are we doing? We're getting a push, okay? Boom! We're not just tapping the ground because that's not going to generate enough force, which we need a lot of force early in the run. Remember that. It's a big, important characteristic here. Once you've gotten out of that third step, now you can start focusing on building up frequency, getting quicker, rising taller and taller, and eventually getting toward maximal velocity. But on these first three steps, you really got to use time, time on the ground to generate force, generate that momentum, which is going to help us accelerate as we go. Now, if you're having trouble with grasping this concept of spending a little bit more time on the ground early in the race and you tend to pull your feet off the ground too soon and you're not generating enough force for this part of the run, I would highly suggest using really heavy sled pulls as these are going to force you to re recognize the importance of the time aspect of producing force. If you load 150 pounds on a sled and you try to sprint with it, and you're just tap dancing, you're not gonna go anywhere, okay? If you're doing the dumbass agility ladder move where you're just ah, tap, 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 which does nothing for speed, absolutely nothing. If you're doing that, if you're coming out of the blocks and just tap dancing your way through those first three steps and you hop onto a heavy sled and you try to sprint with it as you pull, you're gonna notice that thing's gonna whip you back. You're probably gonna, you know, feel defeated because <laughs> you are defeated by it and once you learn to overcome that and you learn to defeat the sled you learn to lock in that shin angle remember what we said at the beginning you want to get that shin angle locked in and once you get that locked in to where you're able to push in that first step get out forcefully now what do you have to do well you have to propel yourself up and out so that way you have enough space relative to the ground to reorient your limbs to then boom get the other leg to strike down and back once you get that second step, work on getting to one, two, three steps and bring it out to maybe 10 steps with that heavy sled. But by using that heavy sled, it's going to force you because of the environmental constraint that it provides to boom, give a little bit of a push. OK, um, and because it slows you down a little bit, I think it's easier to work on that. Um, and it's also a little bit easier to sense where is your body. You can film yourself while you do it, start to see. Oh, what do I default to? Do I reach out? Do I get, try to cut my stride short? Do I try to overstride and stay open too long and push too long? You know, these are all things that you can identify when you watch yourself on a sled. Another very important thing related to early acceleration is eccentric hamstring strength. So Nordic ham curls, um, single leg eccentrics on a back extension machine or a glute ham raise, razor curls. These are all great things that you can utilize. Um, RDLs are good. I will say that once you get to a certain level of strength, like I've done RDLs as high as like 405 or 415, and uh, at a certain point it becomes so heavy that you're just working back strength and grip strength more than hamstring strength. And so I would say at a certain point it's probably worth looking at exercises that are very isolated to the hamstring group. And that's why I suggest the Nordic ham curls, the single leg eccentrics on a back extension or on a glute ham raise. Those are really good exercises for strengthening the hamstrings because early in the race, when you're throwing that knee forward, your foot is going to swing forward and that angular momentum is going to want to open the knee, right? Just like I'm opening this. If I throw my arm, my the angular momentum of this upper or the lower arm moving is going to want to take pretend this is my foot is going to want to open if this were my leg and this was the knee it's going to want to open the leg as you throw the throw the leg forward in early acceleration so being able to slow that movement down and reverse it it takes eccentric strength and it takes a lot of it to bring the whole leg forward without the leg opening up so we want to be able to throw the leg forward but not let the leg open up 
and that requires eccentric hamstring strength. So I'd highly advise utilizing exercises like that if you're having trouble with early acceleration. Last, we want to work on ankle stiffness because when you strike back to the ground, you don't want your foot to hit the ground and have your ankle collapse, okay? That's going to be time spent on the ground that is not efficient. If you hit the ground and you're hitting it at the right point relative to your center of mass, you're pushing while you're on the ground and then pulling your foot off the ground once there's no more room to push, that's an efficient use of ground contact time and you want to maximize that. You don't want to go over that. You don't want your foot to be on the ground when you have nothing to push against. That's an inefficient use of ground contact time. Also, if you hit the ground and your ankle collapses, that is an additional inefficient use of ground contact time. So want to make sure that you're physically capable of utilizing the ground contact time effectively, both from a structural standpoint, like your ankle stiffness, as well as the awareness of how far, how far is too far when we're talking about you know, pushing on the ground. And that can only be found as a result of experimenting, seeing what happens. I would say if you ever see your knee locking out, you're probably extending too long and st staying on the ground too long. Okay, there should always be a slight lack of full extension at the knee, particularly in early acceleration. And then as you go, that's gonna become more and more pronounced throughout the race where you're seeing less and less knee extension on the backside when you push into the ground. Additionally, another way to see if you're pushing too long, if right after you have ended the push into the ground, your whole leg comes up instead of coming forward and through to the front side, that's another sign that you're probably pushing too long or like using your hamstrings in an inefficient manner because you're trying to pull your foot off the ground behind you and then through. You want to be able to push into the ground, but then immediately reverse that and pull the leg through forward in front of you. Now, to ensure that you're strong enough to do that, I would suggest doing some hip flexor strengthening exercises, probably with a cable at first. You could do a band, but I question the like the force characteristics of using a band. The more hip flexion you get to, the greater the force on the band, and I don't think that that is a good way to train relative to sprinting because in sprinting, I believe you have to produce the most force with the hip flexor right at the beginning of hip flexion, and it's not so important when the knee is higher. So I prefer a cable because you can accelerate that load with a cable and it becomes less forceful throughout the movement. The most force is required at the beginning, so I would use a cable for that type of exercise. You can try a band, but I, I'm not a fan of it. When you're in your stance and you're getting ready to sprint, you're gonna wanna keep your head in line with your torso. I have a huge problem with keeping my head forward, and what does that do? It shifts my center of mass forward, which now is gonna throw off everything else. And I think that is one reason why I have a tendency to hurt my hamstrings, is because my center of mass is slightly off because my head is forward, and also that pulls on the nerves a little bit, and that can create some tension which can be felt in the hamstrings if you're really inflexible. Uh, so I would think that it is very important to uh, align your head to your torso when you're in the, on your marks position. Then when you move into set, your whole body should shift and your head should not move independently of your body. You don't wanna bring your body up, but not your head, okay? You don't wanna bring your body up and then bring your cock your head up too. You wanna bring your body up and your head in a manner to where the whole system shifts so that you're kind of locked into that position. Um, so recapping, early in the sprint you really want to focus on using time to your advantage which means you're going to be able to put more force into the ground. You want to make sure that the angle at which you're starting with your front shin is locked in at a position to where you can push through that angle so you're not wasting time or energy getting to the right position before you move. Additionally, you want to throw your elbows okay so that way you're not karate chopping your way through the race but you're using your arms efficiently moving at the shoulder if you throw the elbow you'll move at the shoulder if you throw the hand you'll move at the elbow so we want to throw the elbow to get the shoulder joint to be the place where the arm movement is coming from um, and that's going to help us propel ourselves out effectively you want to strike down and back at the track you don't want to let the knee open up and stomp down or stomp in front of you okay 
We want that, that leg to move, come through forward and then move down and back. To do that, you're gonna need hamstring strength, which you're gonna develop with Nordic hamstring curls, single leg, eccentric back extensions, uh, razor curls on the glute ham raise. Those are great ways to do it. Sorry, my cat's yelling, or one of them is. And then also you're gonna wanna use uh, heavy sleds to train that forceful push that you need on those first three steps. My next video, I'm gonna go over ex uh, later acceleration, and then eventually we'll get into top speed, speed endurance, and some other stuff. Uh, while you're here, please subscribe, check out my Patreon if you haven't yet, and uh, check me out on Instagram, website, all that good stuff. Catch you next time, this is Cody with Athlete X. Leave any questions you have in the comments below. Thanks.